So, um, I, I want to start off by saying um, I'm going to speak in English. I hope that's okay. Okay? My money is in Montreal. It's not just in the money I love. I don't know what I'll be speaking on, you know? Um, but um, I hope that's okay with you. I know, Pastor, when you asked me to, to, to speak, and I, I informed your pastor that I'm going to be speaking in English, and he said it's okay. Um, I have spoken, even in Ethiopia too, in, in, in English, and I think you mentioned maybe a translator uh, could help, but I know that would be a little off, weird. I, I, I've, I've done a translation before in Ethiopia, and, uh, and it gets interesting. Uh, I remember, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Bayside Church. Uh, so they, they have an English service and then they have a Mariana service too. And so when, when I was doing the Mariana service, you know, they, they gave me a translator. And they were really, really, really good. You know, the guy is just amazing. And, and some of the words, you know, I know I'm not right. And so when he was translating, I knew he was saying the wrong things. And so I was having to correct him. So that was a bit humorous, but the other part that was so interesting to me was there's such an animated, uh, you know, in, in our culture, and, and as well as in, in other African countries, preachers are often, often very animated, right? You know, you're yelling, you're screaming, you're sweating, you're... That's how you preach. And I'm not that type of preacher, you know, I'm very calm, I'm talking to you the way and so I would say something, and he would be so animated, like far more than me, you know? And uh, I remember one time, I don't remember exactly what I said, but it's along the lines of, you know, the spirit of the Lord touched the, the individual or something. And he took it, you know, he said, exactly my job, so you know, what's it for that part? You know, and so I looked around and he's like, do you want to speak? You know, he said, I mean, um, but I, 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 you know, so when he asked, you know, you want a translator? And Mark went there, and I was like, no. It's just better off. But, you know, I, I think I'm confident that God um, knows no barrier in language. Um, whatever God wants to do, he will do, whether I'm speaking to you in a mind or in English or any other language. Right? Um, the, the God that we serve knows, knows no barrier in culture or anything. Um, so I don't think that would be an issue. Secondly, this is my first time here in this church. Uh, I actually honestly only know maybe two individuals here. Um, I don't even know. Sometimes I wonder how I even got here. Um, and maybe some of you, the young, the young ones, maybe I do know. There was an event that we used to do in Los Angeles called Uprising. So maybe some of you have, I know one of you at least have been here before. Or maybe the rest of you, uh, if you've got kids, maybe you've sent them. But just to give you a little backdrop, backdrop of who I am, I have been to Seattle many times, mostly to speak at another church, uh, Nine Gilded Church. Um, and also, I think about a year ago, I was here, um, we had a film screening, there's a movie called La Madina, I don't know if any of you have heard that I produced. Um, so there was a screening of that film here in Seattle, so I came for that. Um, but so I'm not familiar with Seattle, but, so for those of you that, don't, that I don't know, hopefully I'll get to know it. Um, just to give you a little back, background of who I am, so that you can understand me. Um, I wasn't raised in church. My dad was an atheist father, but the most incredible man that I know. Um, Mom was part of the church goer. So growing up, this was new. I, I wasn't used to the cutting of the church. Um, but there were great, you know, great parents individually. But my, my grandma was a very devoted uh, Protestant church goer, and so. I think the first time, the first time I stepped foot in church was when I was nine years old. My grandma took me to church, and um, it was kind of like a Bible study of a bunch of elderly people, and this was in Dallas, and so the preacher, um, I think the message was really targeted towards me, and the whole time he was preaching on the top of hell, and so I was just scared to death sitting there, and then he said, you know, how many of you want to avoid hell? And I was like, me, I'm going to the first one, so I went to the front and, you know, repeated the prayer that he wanted me to pray, and, and I prayed, and, and they told me I was saved. And so that was my first encounter with church. Uh, and then my grandma decided to go back to Ethiopia, and so we stopped going to church. 
or I stepped in the church. Um, but it wasn't until 17, when I was 17, um, I went to Florida, and I, I don't know if the volume was good, it sounds like a little, you guys were good? Okay. Um, so when I was 17, um, I grew up playing sports in Dallas, and there was a sports camp that was being held in Florida, Panama City Beach, Florida. And the guy that was conducting the camp was a guy that played for the Dallas Cowboys named Gordon Banks. And so I was told, you know, he's doing a camp, you know, would you be interested in going? And I said, yeah, absolutely, I'd love to go. And so we went to the camp, and it was a really nice area and stuff, but I didn't know it was kind of like in a trick into, it's actually a church camp. And so during the day, we'll do a lot of athletic training and stuff, and then at night time, he would get up and share his life story. And so Gordon Banks had, um, had been a believer and also a pastor by that time. And so the message that he was speaking and the gospel that he, he was preaching really, really magnetically drew me close to uh, what he was talking about. And so I'll never forget it. It was June 25th, 2000. It wasn't in a church service. It wasn't at a, you know, this kind of environment. But it was on the, on the beach in Panama City Beach, Florida that I gave my life to the Lord. And it changed everything about me. And uh, he eventually became kind of like a father figure and a mentor to me, and actually pastors a church called uh, Overcomers here in Seattle, um, in Auburn, in a city called Auburn. And I was like, me and your family have attended the service there, and when I spoke there a few times, you guys have participated. Um, and so, I never thought I would go into uh, church or ministry, but I knew that whatever um, I was going to do in life, that I wanted to use it to draw people closer to the heart of God. Uh, because everything that I've experienced in that moment changed, drew me closer to God. And so when I went, that was my last year in high school, and so when I went back to my high school, we started doing a small Bible study with a couple of people that I knew uh, before school started. And, you know, it grew from five people to 10 people, 20, 30, and stuff. And so, you know, by the end of the year, we'll have about 100 people or so before school started. We get together and have a Bobby study, you know, donuts and Bobby study. Um, and then graduated, uh, I mean, uh, graduated high school and then went to uh, university at Texas State University. And again, it was not Bible school or anything like that. Uh, but they are the same thing. I knew um, what God meant in my life. And with some of my friends that were playing sports, we started doing a little Bible study. And we called it midnight, Friday nights at midnight. We'd get together and started with just six of us in my own room. And then it grew to 5, 10, 20. By the end of the year, we will have about 250 people or so that would get together every Friday night at midnight. And so when the school found out that there's 250 students gathered together at midnight, they thought, there's no way you guys are doing Bible study or anything. Nothing good could come out of that many people gathered at midnight. You know, and so they insisted that we don't do that anymore. We move out. And so we ended up having to have our own place. A guy named Shane Bernard, I don't know if any of you know who that is, who's a Christian gospel artist. So he used to live there, he gave us his warehouse to meet, and we started doing our service there. We would meet Friday night and midnight. It was interesting because it was in the middle of all the clubs and the bars and, and stuff were um, that this warehouse was. And so we would open the garage and the rooms and we would have a, a band that leads worship and all the attempt to do teaching. And so for four years, that's what we were doing. And then one same year, we would do an event where a few thousands of people would gather together. We would bring in all these different speakers and artists to pray. And some of the Hillsong team would come. So that's what I was doing. But never did I get involved with the Ethiopian community or the Alisha community ever. Until in LA, I went in 2000, 2005. They heard about what I was doing in Texas. And so they invited me to do kind of like a little camp, um, like you guys are doing here uh, tomorrow. And so I've never, never done that before, and I said, sure, I'll come. And so I went, maybe 10 people or 10 kids, and I've never done high school. I don't, I don't even know how to relate to high school kids. And so, but my heart was really, really just um, stayed there, you know? And for the first time, I think in my mind, I realized maybe God, you know, wanted me to start a community. Um, there's a reason why I'm here again, and there's a reason why I'm a believer. And so, when the church asked me, would I be willing to move to LA to help uh, you know, start something, because they didn't have anything, and I said, all right. I prayed about it, and I knew God was telling me to go there. So in 2006, I was only 22. 
Pat got right after graduation, moved to Los Angeles, and started a ministry called Paradigm. And so, and was there for 14 years or so, but then the ministry grew into a church, now it's an actual church. And so it's been amazing to see it become what it is. And so, I'm 36 now. I'm not a youth pastor, to be honest with you, nor was I ever really, really a pastor per se, but I don't even know, because youth in our community, it's, it's an obscure word. There are 30 year old guys that are calling themselves youth still. You're not youth, you're an adult. Youth is really high school, you know, until so you're getting ready to go to college. And then after that, you become a young adult, you know? Um, and so we were doing a young adult ministry here. Anyways, now to rewind back to today, um, what I wanted to share with you, I guess, a little bit of the content of it is, is from the book of Luke, Luke chapter 5. Uh, for the last two, three years or so, um, if, if you haven't heard anything that I've said so far, I hope you'll hear this part. For the last two, three years, I've been away from the Ethiopian community. I resigned my position from being the young adults pastor in, in LA two years ago. And um, of course, we we're doing a lot of film related stuff. Uh, and also, I wanted to spend time with family with you. So, I haven't stepped foot in an ego and church for two and a half years. So this is all new to me right now. And so when Pastor asked me, or when I first got the invite, I was like, no, I don't think I could do it. Um, and then on top of that, I was in Ethiopia. I just came back a week ago. Um, it was four different countries that I was at, so I didn't think I was going to be able to make it. And then on Friday, again, I'm going to Europe. So when they were, when they were asking me, I said, I haven't done youth ministry in years, you know? And I, I don't even know how to relate to, to, to that community. And on top of that, I haven't been in the Ethiopian church in such a long time. I've been beat up in the Ethiopian church, you know, and so I know that I know the feeling. And so it's like, hey, I've served my dues. You know, it's, it's the time, time for other, gender, other people to, to do that. So, but anyways, God has his reasons on why um, I needed to be here. And so this is more, far more than me giving to you guys. I feel like this has given back to me something as well. And so when I was praying, you know, what can I uh, share from? In my personal devotion, there's a story of Jesus' encounter with his disciples that have been so instrumental for me the last two years. Um, before, it's interesting, even when you're not intentionally doing it, you could pick it up when you're in ministry and when you're in church, you know, you read your Bibles because everybody's doing it or you're, you know, studying the Word so that you could preach, you could minister, but now, I don't have those obligations. I read it for me. It's beautiful for me, my own personal growth, and my own personal relationship with God. And that in itself has been so wonderful to me. You know what I mean? Um, I don't have a congregation to lead anymore. I'm my own congregation to lead now. And the lessons that I'm learning here has been so instrumental to me, not only just to discover, rediscover who I am, but also to rediscover the heart of God. And so what I wanted to do today is share with you from Luke chapter 5, the story of Peter. Um, and I've preached from the life of Peter many times before, but the beauty of the, the Word of God is every time you go back to it, there's something new you could draw from it, right? That's why it's a living Word of God and not just a written Word of God. It's alive, because when you read it, each time it means something to, to you and I. And so, I want us to read the first call of, of, of uh, uh, or the first encounter that Jesus has uh, with Peter. And so Luke chapter 5, we'll read it, and then we'll pray and dissect the scripture. So go to Luke chapter 5. But my name is Luke. No? Okay, chapter 5. One day, he says, this is verse 1. It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of um, another uh, Translation says uh, Tiberius. By the sea of that Tiberius, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fisher who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats and noticed that Jesus is uninvited to get into the boat. They didn't tell him, come in. He just invites himself into the boat. The one belonging to Simon. He asked him to put a little from the shore, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, 
put out into the deep water and left the net for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and have caught nothing. But because you say so, I will let down the net. When they had done so, they caught such a large amount of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them and, and to fill the boats. Um, and then the boat began to sink. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the cash at the catching of the fish that they had taken. And so were James, John, and sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Or another translation, I think, said it better. It said, From now on, you will be fishers of men. So they pulled their boats from the shore, left everything, and followed him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, we come before you today and this afternoon, God, uh, thank you for this time that you've given us. I thank you for every single person that is in this room. Thank you for your word that is alive. I thank you that you could draw from it. I pray that your spirit could teach us something. I pray that our eyes, not just uh, hear the words that I'm, I'm saying, Lord, that our hearts would open and, and feel and understand and conceptualize your word so that it could be applicable for us today. God enable me to speak the word in a way that is understandable and receivable, that everything that comes out of my mouth, God, bring honor and glory to your name. Pray that every single person in this audience, Lord, realizes the purpose and the reason why they're sitting here in this room and this time set, set apart for me. Minister to us, soften our hearts, encourage us, empower us, call us back to your heart, Lord, and I pray that the burdens that we've carried coming into this room would be removed by the time we walk out of this room. Pray that the hopes that we were buried and the dreams and the goals that we have thought that we lost, God, I pray that you resurrect those things today. There are relationships with you that have been that have withered. God, I pray that you would just re-strengthen them and bring them back to life. If there are dead souls inside of us, God, I pray that you bring life into us. Do the work only you do. You are the God of resurrection, so resurrect our life to see you for who you are. We love you, we honor you, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so when, when reading the story to the naked eye, it just seems so simple. And so to me it's so simple too, you know, this is the call of Jesus to the first disciple. But this here is a well that we can draw from here, and I truly hope I'm, I'm a, like a filmmaker, a screenwriter, so I, I visualize the thing, and so I, I hope you will do the same with me. And so, this is Jesus' first encounter with his disciples, and Jesus called them later on to make disciples, right? And what I see here is Peter, his career up to this point, is a fisherman, right? That's his profession, that's what he's good at. He's a fisherman. And that's his career. That's what he's built his life to do up to this point. Out of nowhere, Jesus comes into the sea. And I want you to notice where they are. They are at the Sea of Tiberias, or the Sea of Galilee. It's one, one sea that's in that area. That's where they are. And when Jesus arrives there, there's a multitude, there's a crowd that's coming to listen to him speak. And so because Jesus needed a place of elevation in order to, because they don't have microphones or whatever to speak, and so he needed a place of elevation to communicate to the audience, he looks around and he sees an empty boat. Again, visualize this with me, because why is the boat empty? The boat is empty because Peter, who is a fisherman, who spent the day trying to catch fish, but he caught nothing. This is what he's good at. This is what he's hoped for, to catch fish. But in that day, he caught nothing. Now, the scripture tells us Peter and some of his friends, they are cleaning their nets, right? They didn't catch any fish, so why are they cleaning their net? Somebody, I think, said it. Because they caught, they didn't catch fish. They caught seaweed and ocean debris. 
And so this thing that they hoped for didn't arrive, but instead what they've caught is dirt and debris. And so they're spending their afternoon cleaning all this waste that they've caught. Just pause there for a second. The reason the boat is empty is because Peter is empty from the good that he was hoping to produce. Again, when I was seeing this, I was reflecting it back into my life. And how do we make that relatable to you and I? Because oftentimes, that's the nature of us too. There are things that we hope for. There are visions and dreams or purposes or goals that we've had. We cast our net into something, but that wish that we're hoping to catch, we never catch. But instead, when we draw that which we've tossed, we're not bringing back what we hope for, we're bringing back a lot of disappointment, a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of wounds. That's what Peter is cleaning. I've done that in my life. I've tried to be a better friend, or other people have done that in my life. They've tried to be better friends to me, and maybe I've hurt them. And now they're reverting back, and when they revert back, all they've got to show for their good effort is debris of broken hopes, broken dreams. Am I related to somebody? Am I the only one that I've been through that? I know in our, in our community, it's a shame to even dare attempt to say you've got any struggles. But I hope that's not the case here. Because we all have weaknesses, we all have struggles, right? And in fact, if we're unable and unwilling to show God our weakness, or that we should struggle the most with, how could He heal? Do you remember the story when Jesus on the Sabbath tells the man, stretch forth your hand? You guys remember that? It was on the Sabbath. That man, by the way, had a chance to stretch two hands, one of each. He had the good hand that he could stretch forth and receive a blessing and could say amen and walk away. Or he could stretch forth his withered hand and receive a healing. Most of us, when we come into a gathering like this, we just want to say, you know, our, our good things and receive a blessing and walk away. But God's heart is to do a real internal surgery in us so that we can walk out healed, you know? And so in here, Peter had cast his hope. And he caught nothing. And so he's cleaning debris and, and, and ocean dirt. And I know there's some of us in here that have probably done that. I've done marriage counseling before. I've done parental counseling before. When you sit with people, it's amazing how much debris all of us carry but are unwilling to admit in itself that it is a weakness or it is a struggle. You know what I mean? And so, Peter here is cleaning it the blue. And the two is also, it's kind of embarrassing. And the reason people are unwilling to show their weakness is because they feel embarrassed about it. And I'm pretty sure that's the case for Peter, because he's looking around and seeing, man, I wish I had caught some fish today. Because had I done that, when all these people are gathered around my boat, they would have known what the fisherman that I was. Does that make sense? That's logical. No, that's what you would have said. You would have said that. You've tried your best for something, and when you don't receive the reward that you are hoping for, you get disappointed. No. I, I mean, I'm not publish our parents. I know how disappointing they get when, they, when I don't bring A in school or something. You know what I mean? And so I know what that's like. And so Peter, he was hoping, I wish I caught fish, but I caught nothing. And now a rabbi is coming in inside my boat, and I don't have anything good to show. Peter is empty. But here's the beauty of emptiness. Just because you're empty, it does not mean God's still not at work. Nobody says amen in this church. Um, maybe I should start screaming. I've learned God does still a lot of great work in silence. And it's easy for you and I to only show our, our strength or to flex our strength. But oftentimes, it's our weakness that God uses the most. If Jesus, is, I mean, if Peter's boat was, was filled with fish, I don't think Jesus would have entered it. But because of the emptiness of his boat, Jesus came in. 
And you and I don't despise some of your emptiness. Maybe that emptiness, that vessel in itself is that which that God is willing to use to feed those that are around you. I know I'm getting personal here, and I hope that's okay with you. I was watching an interview the other day with Stephen Colbert. I don't know if you know who who he is, but he was giving an interview on CNN. And the, the, uh, the, the guy that was asking him the question asked him, you recently said, this is Stephen, who is a comedian, you know, he, the, the late show, one of probably the most popular show on TV, you know. But he's a believer of Stephen Colbert is. And his story is, when he was nine years old, his dad and his two brothers died in a plane crash. And, and so he knows what a pain is like. And so Stephen Colbert said, existing and living is a gift from God. And with existing and with living comes both good and bad. I can't be thankful just for the good that I have, but I have to be thankful also for the bad. And he was saying this to a man who just lost his mother. The interviewer, I think it was Anderson Cooper, who just buried his mom. So he was telling him, I could understand that pain. And all I could tell you is embrace it. And so Anderson Cooper, in this interview, he was crying. And so that's what Stephen Colbert said. It's because I have to embrace both the good and the bad. And Anderson Cooper said, see, anybody likes to say that to me, and I will be offended. But when you said it to me, it clicked because I know you've lost a father and two brothers. And Stephen said, that's the beauty of pain. And make sure of it. Had he not gone through that pain, he would not have been related to his pain. He would not sympathize. You know what I mean? And so what I'm saying to you is sometimes I think when God calls us, the deeper your relationship with God goes, the, the, the deeper you understand pain itself. And the, and the greatest miracle that you witness is not being in it pain free, but the greatest miracle you witness becomes endurance through the pain. I witnessed that from two people that I love dearly. My, my dad, um, he was a politician in the, in, the, in the past, so he spent 14 years in prison. Ethiopia, 14 years in prison. My, I hate even using the word stepmom because she, she's just like a mom to me. But, you know, I, in fact, I called her mom probably since I was a kid. And so she was the most incredible human I know. She fought her case, his case, never left him, never abandoned him, did everything and beyond that she could do to raise my two brothers and take care of them and fight his case. And so 15 years, or 14 and a half years in prison, and finally, miraculously, my dad gets released. Within six months, and she lived in Nashville, uh, uh, his wife. She lived in Nashville. Within six months of, after him being released from Ethiopia, miraculously, he also get a visa to come to the U.S. And so he comes. This is in 2006. So he comes to the U.S. And I know how much I've longed to be reunited back with my dad, but more than me and more, more than my brothers, I was so happy to see her be finally fulfilled. And for him too, he's been longing to see her. They just have the most beautiful, romantic relationship I've ever seen. It's picture perfect. And so I was so happy for her. And I went to Nashville to be with them. I spent like a few days and then I went back to, to LA. I think it was the day before, two days before Thanksgiving, my dad calls and he said, Hey son, would you please? My dad's a believer now, by the way. Uh, he wasn't an atheist, but not anymore. And so he said, son, would you please pray for her? You know, he calls her mom. Call, 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 pray for your mom. She had to go to the hospital with some kidney issue. I didn't think anything of it. And I said, yeah, sure, sure, we'll pray. And uh, two days later, it was Thanksgiving Day, she passes away. Now, 15 years separated. 14 years and a half, he's been in prison gets out, he comes to the U.S. Within three weeks, his wife passes away. 
Okay? He's in a new country. By the time, the time he went to prison and he was released, the world had changed. Before he went to prison, there was no such thing as internet, or that we know of. The computer, everything is just developed country, everything has changed. Now he's in, and I can only imagine the pain he's going through. And so we go to the funeral, we have the burial, everything. And I'm looking around, and my dad is so composed, he's so strong about this whole thing. And so after, a few days after the funeral, I was getting ready to come back to LA, and I was sitting down with him, and you know, us Abishas try to be macho and stuff, and so I thought that's what he was doing. And so I told him, you know that, it's okay to break down and complain. I was frustrated at God. I'm like, where is God? Just a few weeks ago, we were saying, thank you, God, and then exactly four weeks later, she passes away. Where is God in the scripture? And so I was sitting down, and I said, God, it's okay to complain. And he looked at me and he said, you think I've got a reason to complain to God? I was like, yeah, you do. You've got a lot of reasons to complain to God. He said, no. You've got a lot of things to be thankful for. He said, the way I see it is that God loved me and honored me enough to give me one month with my wife. See, it's a matter of perspective. And, and it just blew me away that he said that. But what's crazy is that my dad now, he's so like compassionate and just encouraging towards those that go through difficult times like that because he knows what it's like to hurt. You know what I mean? So there's the beauty of, of emptiness because God is still you. It wasn't just for him, but also his ability to minister to others. You know what I'm saying? And the second person, I know I'm giving you to be an example too, but the second person was my aunt. My aunt has an autistic son, and he has a severe case of autism. Now he's 16 or 17. He's 6'6". Six, six. He's a huge kid. Had like about 280 pounds. There's not a church service that she's not taken him to. There's not those miracle services that she had not taken him to. There's not anything that you know, she's tried to it's just, it's, it's, it's really hard because he, you know, he can't go to the bathroom on his own, he can't speak, he can't eat, and then so, so, and so my, my, but my, my aunt is so thankful, and, you know, she's a good mother, and so finally, there was a guy that was coming for me, okay, this is a few years ago, Mr. Wonderful, that, that does miracles, that was coming, he wanted to pray for a Christian, for things Christian, and so they go to the house, and, you know, Pray and he said, you know, God has revealed to me he's going to heal your son, whatever. And so he prays for him, and and of course, you know, nothing happens. And then the guy gets up and he says, it's because the miracle doesn't happen because you lack faith to her. And I was there that day, and my, you know, if, if it was me, I would probably slap him. But my my my, my aunt has better self control. One of the, the fruits of the spirit is self-control. And so she said, that's because you missed the greatest miracle when you walked in. And he goes, what's that? She said, the, 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 the miracle of endurance. The miracle is not him. The miracle is what God is doing in me. That was, it gave me goosebumps when she said that. You know? Because sometimes that's what we think. The miracle, we wanted it there. But the miracle is maybe God is doing with your emptiness. So the miracle is that God has given you grace to endure the unendurable. That's a miracle. And so in this case, when, when Peter is filling, I mean, when Jesus is filling Peter's boat, Peter wished there was something else that he could have had in the boat, but Jesus is busy witnessing and feeding others. And Peter is probably thinking, what about me? You know, but Jesus is focused on feeding others. And so in your emptiness, sometimes it may seem as though God is ignoring you while feeding others. I'm sure some of you adults have complained that before, because that's a common prayer. God, you've done this for so and so, what about me? And then in this story, though, after Jesus gets done feeding the multitude, he then turns to the guy that needs the feeding the most, and it's Peter. And I want you to picture Peter, he's sitting there, seaweed, grabbing seaweed, 
the griefs, the wounds, the things, and he's thrown it. And then Jesus looks at him and he says, okay, your turn. I want you to cast your net even deeper. Please, conceptualize this. Peter had just spent hours cleaning the griefs. And Jesus turns around and says, throw it again. And Peter is probably thinking again, I'm a fisherman, you're a carpenter. What do you know about this anyways? He could, he could have rationalized this way out of obedience, which most of us fail at doing. Obedience. So Peter here does something against his conscience. He's willing to obey just because he said so. And he said it in here. Master or rabbi is the correct word of the translation. He says, rabbi, he said. We've tried this many times before and we caught nothing. But because you said so, I'm willing to do it again. Although I know I'm just going to grab my net back, my hopes back, my dreams back, and all I'm going to be doing is just pulling pain, disappointment, and hurt. That's all I'm good for. But because you said so, I'll do it. And he does it. And when he does, you know the story, he catch fish that he couldn't contain. And so he asked his buddies to come and draw the net and tow it. And he lays it down and it's fish that beyond what you've ever seen before. See, that's the critical point right there. And Jesus is standing watching him. And Peter is looking down at the fish. And he looks up. And he falls down, he says, away from me. I'm a simple man. You see, that's the test of character. Peter could have been so blinded by the fish, he would have said, man, thank you so much for this incredible thing that you've done for me, man. This is career set. This is my career right here, you know? This, this will last me a lifetime. I could sell this and go retire soon. I could go to Rome now. But Peter doesn't fall in love with the channels. Peter falls in love with the source. He doesn't even pay attention to the fish. He turns around to Jesus and he falls down and he says, I'm a sinful man. And that's when Jesus said, okay, this was never about fish anyways. Your purpose is not to catch fish. Your purpose is to catch men. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. See, all of this stuff that Jesus was doing was to get him to this point in which he falls in love with the channel. How many people, I know, I know a lot of people that falls in love with the channels, or the sources, I mean with the channels, and ignore the sources. But Peter doesn't do that. And now, if we, if we, if we just arrive at this point, and if this was the conclusion of Peter's life, it's still a lot, of, a lot of incredible things to draw from, no? But that's just the beginning of Peter's story. I don't know why my timetable is here, Pastor, but I just wanted to finish with a couple of more things here. After the story, Peter's life, because Peter is not known for eloquence, but, but we know he's his love and devotion to God. And so here is Jesus. He released his purpose to him. You're not called for fish. You're called for men. Leave everything and follow me. And Peter instantly leaves his boat. The multitude of fish that he just caught and starts following Jesus. That's incredible. Now there are a few highlight points in Peter's life that we know for the sake of time. I'll just paraphrase some of them. The next sequence that I'm just so marveled by Peter is in John chapter 6. If you remember, it's one of the miracles only mentioned in all four Gospels. The feeding of the 5,000. Jesus feeds the minimum population of 5,000, and they eat. And then Jesus takes his disciples, and by the river, by the sea, he goes to the other side of the river. And when he gets there, the crowd somehow outran the boat and got to the, the shoreline before Jesus did. And they get off the boat and they see the multitude again, and Jesus says, you didn't come here because you wanted me. You came here only for more food. And if you want food, 
eat me, I'm the bread of life. And the crowd said, this is harsh teaching, who could accept this? And they all fall away. And then Peter, I mean Jesus, looks into the disciples and he says, what about you? Are you still interested in channels, and means, and what I could do for you? What about you? Do you want to be like them too? And of all the disciples, it's Peter that makes a comment. What does he say? To whom do we go back to? You're it. You're all that we want. Again, he doesn't fall in love with the source, with the channel, he sees in love with the sources. To whom do we go back to? Another part that I remember of Peter is Jesus now, it's like midway through his his three and a half year journey with the disciples, and so they're having a little campfire, and Jesus asked them, let me ask you, who do men say that I am? Who do your people, your homies, your friends say that I am? And one of them says, oh, they say you're one of the prophets of old. And the other one gets another prophet. And then Peter jumps up and he says, that are the Christ and the living God. And then Jesus says, man cannot believe reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And he, that's the first time he says, from this day on, you're not going to be called Simon. From this day on, you're going to be called Peter, which really means rock. Because you now have an understanding of who I am. His name has been changed. The next sequence that I'm just marveled by Peter's life comes Jesus now arrives to the end of his public ministry. And again, he gathers his disciples. We call it the Last Supper. And the, the Prince of Heaven puts an apron and stoops low and starts washing the feet of the disciples. And as he does, Peter said, I can't let you wash my feet. And Jesus said, if you don't let me wash your feet, you've got no part in me. Then Peter goes, not just my feet, wash my whole body. That was Peter. And Jesus washes his feet. They get up from there, and Jesus is walking out of the garden of Gethsemane. He looks at them, because now he knows, in about 24 hours, he's about to be crucified. It's Thursday night. So he looks into all of them, the 12 disciples, and he says, all of you would fall away on account of me. This is a master speaking. All of you are about to fall away on account of me. And then Peter said, not me. If I have to die, I'll die with you, Peter says. And I showed you two things about Peter. One is, he has no regard to the guys that are around him. Because technically what he's saying is, Jesus said, all of you, and Peter said, not me. And in short, what he's saying is, all these other 11 losers might, but I won't. Not me. If I have to die, I'll die with you. And the truth is, he technically is saying, Jesus, did you forget who I am? I'm Peter, the rock, remember? I know more about me than you do. I won't fall away. If I have to die, I'll die with you. And that's why Jesus goes, you think you know more about yourself than I know about Let me give you something about yourself that I know. In a few hours, you will deny me, not once, not twice, but three times. That much I know. Now, why, see the heart of God. Why would Jesus call him to, to discipleship knowing that he would deny him? That's the heart of God, no? And they all walk away, and of course, you know the story. Jesus gets arrested, and they take him to the courtyard. Of all the disciples, it's Peter that runs to follow Jesus. He follows him, and a girl or somebody comes and says, Aren't you one of his disciples? And he says, No, I don't know him. It wasn't like they were going to kill him. Jesus was a known prophet, a known rabbi. He had a multitude that would follow him. He said, I don't know him. Another person came and said, aren't you one of his disciples? I don't know the man, he says. And then the third time, another girl comes and says, you're surely one of his disciples. He 
you know, I don't know. And in fact, the scripture says he started putting curses on himself. What that means is that he was saying, if I know the man, may God condemn me to hell if he needs to. That far he was willing to denounce Jesus. I don't know the man. And instantly a rooster crows. And he remembered the words of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, he would deny me not once but three times. And the scripture says, Jesus, I mean, Peter fell. Because he could see Jesus through the courtyard. And it's almost as if as soon as the rooster crows and he realized, oh, that's three times not just the night. And their eyes probably locked. And he knows he's just messed up. And he wept, that's what the scripture says. You know the story, Jesus gets crucified, he's buried, and then on the third day he's resurrected. Now this is all confusing to Peter because he doesn't un understand it all. But he knows now that Jesus has resurrected from the dead. But when you get to the last part of John, it's John chapter 21, I believe. You could go home and read it. I'm just going to paraphrase it for the for time's sake. When you get there, you read that sequence. There's something in there that Peter says. In the first verse, Peter says, this is after the resurrection. This is the last, the last chapter of the Gospels. Peter says, I'm going back to fishing. He wasn't saying, I'm hungry, I'm going to go grab something to eat. It's been three and a half years of an incredible revival journey that he's been on. And now, it's come to an end, and Peter says, guys, I'm going out to fish. When he's saying that I'm going back to what I know, I've lost my purpose. I've lost who I am. I'm going back out to fish. And the scripture says, all of them said, we'll come with you. Now, it's incredible how much of influence this guy still has. Just because you lose your purpose, it doesn't mean you still lose influence. That's why some people, that once God had called, but now they live in disobedience, but they could still influence people. You just lost the purpose and the calling, but you still could influence people to the good or bad. And so Peter says, I'm going out to fish, meaning I'm going back to what I know the best. And they all go with him. Where do they go? The Sea of Tiberias. What does he do? He grabbed his net, he cast his net. What does he catch? Nothing. But debris. He pulls debris and he pulls debris. Because anytime you abandon the purpose that God has for you, you catch nothing. He caught nothing. He's pulling debris. But guess who's there? The very same place he met him three and a half years ago. And Jesus is still standing. And then he says to him, throw your net again. And still doesn't click to him. He does it. And at that moment, he catches more fish again than he ever thought. And he drops everything. He realizes it's Jesus. And the scripture says he jumps into the water and starts running towards Jesus. And he gets close to Jesus. And now this is their first time seeing each other face to face after this whole thing. They sit down, and Jesus asks them that question. Do you love me more than these? Look, I, again, I've preached from this stuff. I never, I never saw what I'm about to, to say to you. What are the these that Jesus is talking about? You ever thought about that? He's not looking at the trees, he's not looking at the sky, saying, you love me more than these things. No. Do you love me more than these fishes? Let that symbolize something for you. Because this is what Jesus is doing. It's almost as if Jesus was saying, Peter, one thing I know about you is that when things don't go the way you expect them, you've got these things that you keep running back to. They're almost like your security blankets. Habits. Behaviors. 
drugs, alcohols, whatever it is, these things that you keep running back to. Do you love me more than these fish? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. Then Jesus said, feed my lambs. Luke chapter 5, what did Jesus tell him? Get up, follow me. Your purpose is not to catch fish. Your purpose is to catch men. Your purpose is to feed men. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my lambs. He asked him that three times. What is Jesus doing there? Because to Peter, he thought he has abandoned his purpose. The whole dream of changing the world, touching the world, had died the minute I rejected Jesus again. But here it is, Jesus, in John chapter 21, he's saying to Peter, although you've fallen, although you've walked away, I never did. Your purpose is still on. The purpose and the hopes and the dreams that I have for you is still on. Feed my lambs. Now, I don't need to tell you about the rest of Peter's history. And I think it's in the book of Acts. The first time that we hear the word repentance in the book of Acts is with Peter. He tells the group of people that he was witnessing to, he says, repent so that time of refreshing may come in. You know why he would say that? Because he knows what it's like to be refreshed. I know a lot of people that are devoted to God only because they're scared. Listen, you think Christians are the only ones that are devoted to the higher being that they worship? Go to India. A year and a half ago, I went to India um, for the Diwali festival. believe my eyes at how much people are devoted to their object that they worship. The stuff that they're willing to go, the distance that they're willing to get to in order to feel and appease this, this ferocious God that they believe is real. Jesus didn't say, obey me because you fear me. He said, obey me if you love me. And Peter says, you repent not just so that you know you can have an okay moment, you guys have repent so the seasons of refreshing may come in. Connect you guys so that you can be refreshed, not be in fear and, and, and terror. Repent so that seasons of refreshing may come in. I know that again. I hear a lot of things. Which is great. But that's what Peter says. And then later on we'll read the story of Peter. I think it's um, in the history books. Eventually, at the end of his life, when the Romans wanted to, to kill him, they were going to crucify him just the same way they did Jesus. Because crucifixion, by the way, is not something that was just practiced on Jesus. And in college, I was a computer graphics major and a history major. And it's amazing sometimes in church how many people just understand the concept of history. And when you don't understand history, you tend to repeat mistakes over and over again. But crucifixion is something the Romans did for capital punishment. It's a severe form of punishment that they did. Jesus wasn't the only one to be crucified. But they wanted to crucify Peter the same way. And what he said, according to history and the Narcos books, is that he said, I'm unworthy of being crucified the same way my Lord died. So if you could crucify me upside down. And supposedly he was crucified upside down, and that's how Peter died. But when you see his story, it's amazing how far he come. Amen. But more than that, the beautiful thing that you see in this story is not really just the life of Peter. But I want you, the picture that I'm trying to paint here is the heart of the Father. Oftentimes in church, it's easy to be relatable. It's, it's good and it's needed. But if it doesn't connect to the heart of the Father, you're missing the bigger point. It ain't about you. We are, we're humans. We repeat the same things. We do the same stuff. But the heart of God never changes, right? And it's always drawing us closer to God. And, no, and in this story, that's what I see, is that here's Peter, 
that have gone through all these changes, but the way God in Christ pursued him to restore him back to his purpose is so beautiful. Amen? And so if you're here, maybe you're just like Peter. You feel like God is busy answering the prayers and the calls of everybody else while neglecting you. I just want to remind you, just because you're empty, it doesn't mean that God is not at work. He's still doing something incredible in your entrance. Just because you feel like I'm the one that's experiencing pain, why me? You just don't know what God is doing through that. The greatest miracle is a miracle of endurance. Let God use that to touch so many of those that are around you. And you'll be surprised how far God will be willing to take you. I'll be honest with you, the last two years, look, I've spoken in front of an audience this size, and I'm not saying this to brag or anything, but, and I've spoken in front of the size of 10,000 people. I've spoken at a Hillsong event before. That doesn't change anything. But it's so amazing to me. Church, speaking in church is beautiful, it's wonderful. But the last couple of years, my audience has been the unchurched. In Las Vegas, I was invited to speak at the Atheist Convention in 2017, or 2018, because I produced a film that ended up winning a lot of awards. And one guy at the LA Film Festival in Los Angeles in 2007 saw the film, really enjoyed it. Afterwards, I gave a Q&A with the audience and he happened to be in the audience. He loved the film. And me and him started exchanging emails. He said, hey, I love the concept in this movie. What inspired you to tell that kind of story? And I shared him what inspired me to share that story. And back and forth, back and forth. Then he said, hey, there's this event that I produce. I work at UNLV, University of Las Vegas. We produce this event, and it's designed for elements of faith that come from different backgrounds to give a presentation on why it's important to believe in something. Would you be interested in coming? I said, what kind of event is this? He said, the 2018 Atheist Convention. <laughs> All right. You know I'm a Christian. I said, yeah. I said, okay, I went. We're talking like 1,500 people, like 1,500 people. And, and, and so it's just amazing to me when I'm standing here, I'm like, how the heck did I get here? It's because you don't know the doors that God opens when you're just being obedient to someone. When Jesus told Peter to cast his net the second time, it didn't make sense. I just... I just grabbed seaweed and you're telling me to do it at the same place that I caught seaweed at? What are you talking about? I'll do it because you said so. The movie, the movie became, it won the best film at the African Academy Awards in Nigeria. Imagine that. That was the first film I've ever produced. I'm standing there getting the words like, what is going on? National Award for Best Film, and so, and it gives you an opportunity to stand and share your faith to people that will never step foot in church. But you know what's humorous? I remember the first time I said, I told the pastor that I'm going to work on the film. They told me, have you started by sliding? Me too. Jesus, you know Seriously, that was the answer we got. Hey, what does that have to do? No, I wanted to make a movie that could speak to other people outside of just church. But if I, if I wasn't obedient, is, is the point that I'm saying, to something that God had put in me, the opportunities, the chances that you would have missed. And so, in closing, Pastor, I'll take too much time, I'm sure. I just, you know, I'll let you close it out however you see it. If you're in here, whether it be a parent, a child, you know, again, uh, I've counseled, I've been in nine weddings as a groomsman, and uh, yeah, 
always at home, so I never broke. Um, and three of them have already ended in a divorce. Um, and some of them are on a very shaky ground. And I, I always reflect back thinking, those that are at least, that, you know, how did you guys get here? It's all because they kept their struggles hidden. Nobody needs to know. It's all fine. It's right. And they don't allow anybody else to help them grow and heal and mend. I'm just saying that to you. You don't, nobody will ever know the struggle that you and I have. God does. He sees your struggle, He sees your pain, He sees your tears, He sees your cries, He sees everything. You could fool us, you could fool your, your neighbors, you could fool anybody to think that everything is great. You're the most highly favored, blessed, and anointed individual walking on this earth. But inside, you could still be going through turmoil. Whatever it is, God could heal. God could restore. God could renew. God could reset every single thing back to original purpose and send you back out to your destiny and purpose. Amen? And that's what I gather from here. So I'll close another prayer. And like I said, Pastor, if you want, you can come and close it out however you see today. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, um, I come before you humble and grateful for the opportunity that you've given me to speak your word. God, you're a God that searches our heart and sees sincerity. You're near to those with a broken heart. No matter how young we are, how old we are, God, I pray that you would search through by your presence and by your spirit and your and Lord, I pray, including myself, God, that I don't walk out here without being restored by you. Touch us like you touched Peter. Holy Spirit, touch us like you touched him. Like he said, so that seasons of refreshment could come in. That our smile and our joy would be sincere and real, God. God, give us endurance. Give us peace that passes all understanding. We don't just ask that we remove our struggles, but God, in our struggles, may we be with us. What we pray for the most, God, is your companionship through it all. For David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear, because thou art with me. Be with us. Yes, I 
አንድ ሁለትም ሶስት ጊዜ በዚህ ሰፈር ውስጥ አስገርማሚ ነገር ጌታ አይደለም ወደ ህይወቱ ተጋድሎ ወጣ ጀመረ አላቆመ ጀመረ አተመለሰ ሁሉ ጊዜ ኢየሱስ ከዚህ ሰው ጋር ነበር ዛሬም ጌታ ከኛ ጋር ነው ዛሬም ኢየሱስ ክርስቶስ ከኛ ጋር ነው እህቶች ወንድሞች ታላላቆች ታላላሽዎች እግዚአብሔር አይተዋጩ እግዚአብሔር ካንተ ጋር ካንቺ ጋር አይጀምሩ ጉዞ አያቆሙ አሜን ስሙ የተባረከ ይሁን አሜን ስሙ የተባረከ ይሁን አሜን በማንኛውም ሰርክምስታንስ ውስጥ በታልፉ ጌታ ከናንተ ጋር በማንኛውም ሁኔታ ውስጥ ብትሆኑ መንፈስ ቅዱስ ከናንተ ጋር ኢየሱስ ክርስቶስ ለዘላለም ከዘላለም ስሙ የተባረከ ይሁን ለዚህ ጌታ ምስጋና አምልኮ ክብር ይገባው ስለዚህ ይገባው ለናንተስ ለዘላለም ስሙ ይሁን ሃሌሉያ አምል አመስግኑት ይሄን ጌታ ጨምራችሁ ሰንቷቸው ያቃል ብዙ ጊዜ ለጴጥሮስ የነበረው ፍየል ሰዎች ነበር ጌታ በመጨረሻው ከሞትም ከተነሳ በኋላ አቋም እንደገና ያው ጌታ ተደርሶ ወደዚህ ሰው ይወጣ ነበር ጌታ ይባል ጌታ ይባል ክለኛል ብሎ ማጥበው ጌታ ጥለኛል አልፈኛል በማይጠቁ በሰይቶች በገረዶች ፍትፍት እንኳን ክለኛል ብለው አጥተው እንደገና አድል ሰጠው እንደገና ወደ ህይወት መደረሰው እንደገና ወደ መንገድ መደረሰው ዛሬ ኢየሱስ ክርስቶስ ወደ ቤት እየመጣ ወደ ጓዳሽ ወደ ደጅ ወደ ማድሪያ ወደ ምን ተመለከተበት ስፍራ ኢየሱስ ዛሬ ይመጣ ሃሌሉያ ዛሬ ኢየሱስ ክርስቶስ ወደ ህይወት ይመጣ ዛሬ ወደ ቤት ይመጣ አንጋ ስለተመለከ በመታለክ ሰው ደስቶ ኢየሱስ መጥቶ ጉራት ይሆናል ያንተን ባሉት ይሞላ ሃሌሉያ ያንተን ደካማነት አንካራ ያደርገው አንጌታ አሜን ጌታ ሆይ አንተ ሆይ ቃል ተናገረ መረብህ ወደዚህ ታላል የመጨረሻው ተአምር በጴጥሮስ ሲይዝ መረበን ወደ ጥቁ ጣና ጴጥሮስን ወደ ጥቁ ጣና ብዙ አሶች ለምሰለሰል ያንን ነው ጌታ በዚህ ሰፈሩ ያስተማረ እዚያ ባላካችን ሆይና ምስል ነው ክብር ሁሉ ለአንተ ነው ምስጋና ለአንተ ነው ተመስገን ምንገዘላህ ናብለካህ ለዘላለም ጌታ ሆይ ነፍስስ ከማይቀርን ድረስ ላንተ ብቻ ይቆማል አቤቱ አምላካችን ስም ይባል ከፍ ከፍ ነው ስካላንተ ቃል ይፈውሳል የብዙዎች ህይወት ታሪክ ስለቀየረ ተመስገን በቃል ስልጣን ወደ ህዝቦች ወደ ወንድሞች ወደ ተላላቆች ወደ ተላላሽዎች ተመጣ በዚህ ጊዜ ዘያለሁ ናብሰልካህ ናብሰልካህ ናምላካችን ሆይ በኢየሱስ ክርስቶስ ገብቶ ይታቀው ይቀየር አሁን በቀን ቢሰሙ ቃል ደስ ከሰሙ ቃል ደስ ታይካቸው ተቀይሮ ይቀር ባሉታቸው ይብራ ወደዚህ ቤት ተጣሁ ባውራት ይመለስ ዘአብሮ ባውራት ወደ ቤቱ ይሄድ ወደ ባውራት ዘአብሮ ወደ ስራ ገብተው ይመለስ በኢየሱስ ክርስቶስ ብዛብ አምላካችን ሆይ በነዋሪ የሰራው ታላቅ ነገር በዚህ ጉባኤ ይሁን ባለ ይወጣው ጉባኤ ተመለሽ ይሁንልች ዘአብሮ አምላካችን ሆይ ሙላት በዚህ ጉባኤ ይሁን ወጣቶች ወደዚህ ተጠላላችሁ 